everyone for coming here uh, to the CHM seminar uh, today. We have the great honor to have Professor Rishi Kashima. Yeah. I pronounce it properly. Yeah, to see our guest, and uh, so uh, Professor Yushi Kashima is uh, working at the University of Melbourne, and his research mainly focuses on the psychology of cultural dynamics, which is also the topic of our uh, of our today's presentation. And this research goes around how uh, goes around the psychological processes. Uh, that contribute to the process, maintenance, and transformation of culture over time, and with a particular emphasis on the culture of sustainability. So he's very prestigious researcher at least in social psychology and the cross-cultural psychology domains. So his work has been uh, published in Science, Nature, Climate Change, and also many uh, uh, top tier uh, psychology journals like Psychological Review. So he also served as the president of the International Association for Cross Cultural Psychology. So we really look forward to hearing about your research. I will give the floor to you now. Thank you very much, Minchen, for a very kind introduction and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research. I, I decided to give a very broad overview of uh, yeah, things that I've done in the past, and the uh, perhaps say uh, to provide more of a, a framework to for the discussion, and rather than any specific um, uh, details of a, a study. So, um, if you have any questions about any aspects, please let me know, and perhaps so we can talk offline afterwards or elaborate at the time. Anyway, thank you for the uh, great opportunity. And the title is Psychology of Cultural Dynamics. And the, uh, I, as we all know, uh, we have been facing quite a few challenges from the natural environment, including uh, these sorts of large scale uh, extreme weather events coming from uh, climate change, probably, and also from microbial attacks in the form of uh, SARS CoV number two. And the, uh, we have had the uh, lockdowns and so on over the years. And uh, we are also facing not just from the natural environment, but also human made um, uh, threats of conflicts and wars and so on. And of course, humanity has been facing these sorts of challenges throughout the history. And of course, that history of uh, at the course of the evolution of the species. And what we have been doing is really to construct the um, uh, human niche in order to meet those challenges. By a niche, we mean something like a beavers and um, barrows and dams that we construct around ourselves so that the, uh, we can buffer ourselves from the natural environments, but any other sorts of environment. And in the case of humans, we don't make just physical environments physical constructions like houses and buildings and, and roads and so on, but also we construct social institutions. So we construct basically the human-made environment that consists of physical, but also social constructions to um, uh, meet the challenges arising from various environments. And what makes it possible for us to construct those sorts of social uh, human niches is culture. Culture understood as a socially transmittable information and culture enables us to do this, right? These sorts of things, but also do that as well to construct our dwellings, humble dwellings, or maybe not so humble ones as well, and the, uh, um, maybe protect ourselves. But also we can construct these sorts of science and technological achievements and the um, computers, AIs, but not only those, but also social institutions like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Magna Carta. And so how do we use these sorts of cultural information to uh, uh, construct a human, human niche and the uh, meet the challenges? The anthropology's answer to that has been Gil and Herkin's notion and cultural evolution. That is the idea that the, not just the genetic information that's passed on from one generation to the next, but also cultural information. In combination of the two, we develop the accumulative 
abilities to meet the challenges arising from various environments. But the, um, um, the notion of cultural evolution sort of a, a got me, sort of a, a gave me a bit of a weak eek. The reason why is that the, um, as a social scientist, we're full, I'm fully aware of the history, inter intellectual history, of the notion of social evolution as opposed to cultural evolution. And around the turn of the century, previous turn of the century, towards the end of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, the notion of social evolution was used for uh, justifying things like eugenics and discrimination and various other sorts of discriminatory um, AEA uh, treatments. Uh, and the, um, um, you might be thinking, well, that's more than a century ago and things must have changed. Well, the, uh, just very recently, about probably 10 years ago, this study was done asking people in the United States this question, people can vary in how human-like they seem. Some people seem highly evolved, whereas others seem no different than lower animals. Using the image below, that is these images, we indicate using slide sliders, how evolved you consider the average member of each group to be. And the, um, these people are happy to say the average member of Americans is about 90% human. And Australians, not so bad, a little lower, but about 90%. Chinese, a little lower, but okay. Muslims, that was more than 10 years ago. Still, the notion of evolution, the evolve, has a certain connotation. And in the con context of speaking about cultural change and cultural dynamics, I thought probably this is not the best term. And instead, I began to use the term cultural dynamics around 2000. Anyway, so we adapt to various challenges by constructing and modifying human niche. And the, um, one of the things that we have been historically doing to meet those challenges arising out of the environment was to tighten up a culture. So whenever some sort of threats come around, the uh, peoples around the world have tightened up their culture, that is to say, to strengthen the norms so that the individual variability to respond to various things um, is much lessened, and also the deviation from a norm is punished so that the, um, basically there will be a uniformity about human responses to any challenges. What does it do? It tends to increase the uh, uh, likelihood and the ease with which people can co cooperate with each other and coordinate their actions for collective action. If you fail to do that, the solution, you disband or perhaps even worse. But now, yes? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So in this study, I, I don't know that it sounds. So uh, Gil Fan et al. Uh, it was published in. A uh, forget the term. If you like, I can give you a reference. Later. Yeah. How, how did they how did they measure that? Measure the tightness. Yeah. Well, actually, it was a uh, pretty much a self-report measure of okay. in your country how tight in various ways your country is. Yeah. Thanks. And the uh, um, so that that has been the historical and perhaps traditional ways for human cultures to deal with that, those sorts of challenges, tightening up and hardening. But here now, we probably do this as well, and we do have some evidence for it, but the, uh, we engage in massive conversations about how to deal with these sorts of challenges. And the, uh, that makes things more complicated, but in a way that speeds up potentially the process of cultural dynamics and various other culture related um, uh, processes. And the, uh, this is all to construct our collective futures, right? And it's really about you know, how we meet these challenges and the uh, and using our ability to forecast and think about future in order to steer a course towards the future. We don't consciously necessarily think about this, about the, uh, these sorts of political discussions as a way of constructing a future, but I think in the end, that's what we are doing and that would be a consequence. So these conversations could be quite heated and 
could cause something like political polarization. As you probably know, in the United States, there's been some evidence of so-called polarization, bipolarization between Democrats and Republicans, and there's indeed um, clear evidence that the uh, Democrats and the Republicans not only actually diverge in their opinions about various things, but also perceiving them to be very different. And actually, the actual polarization is actually, in fact, much less than the perception of it. So um, um, this thing going on, and uh, as you can see, it's increasing over time. And the uh, people have been saying, well, social media might be playing a role in this case. Um, all this is ongoing com conversation and also investigation in various parts of the world. But the, um, how do we make sense of, of this in terms of cultural dynamics? from my kind of perspective and the uh, um, the rest of my talk is going to be kind of trying to shed light on this uh, from a pretty much a dynamics perspective or processual perspective and how to understand it in order to do it we have to go back to the beginning so as you most of us know the um, the humans as a species modern humans emerged towards the end of the last ice age and came out of east africa and they eventually spread around the world. And so, um, it was really, the turning point was about 10,000 years ago uh, when the climate stabilized. And this is the beginning of the so called the Holocene as the geological epoch. And the, it was incredibly, it has been an incredibly stable climate. And the, uh, this is the average global temperature estimated over time. There were a bit of fluctuations. But it's incredibly stable compared to this kind of the zigzag ups and downs. And the, at the beginning of it, um, the agriculture emerged, Mesopotamia uh, flourished, and the, all these things still continued on. And the, um, up to pretty much the, uh, another turning point was the Industrial Revolution. In the um, 18th century, probably towards the end of 18th century and the early part of the 19th century, he had certain parts of Europe in this country included, and they, um, uh, it began to spread around the world. And just one thing to note, the tiny widths here and there, ups and downs of the global temperature. And every time that blips happen, there has been a conflict. Going up, conflict going down a conflict. And the, um, there's been a fair bit of research about the uh, temperature fluctuation and how that uh, relates to human conflict. And the, um, um, as I said, it, in the 18th century, when the Industrial Revolution began to happen, everything changed. The game changer completely. So this is a 1750, and the, um, um, Whichever is uh, the graph you look at, these are kind of elements in the uh, um, earth systems, uh, ecological systems, carbon dioxide, and some of the greenhouse gases, and the, uh, this is ozone, um, surface temperature, acidic, ocean acidification, whichever is the, uh, um, the uh, stats you look at estimated, um, there is the going up. The uh, starting point is around 1750. And it got even worse after 1950, that is right after the World War II. When the world began to connect and do things together, it really exploded. If you look at the socioeconomic trends, the same thing happens. The, um, this is the population. This is the estimated uh, GDP. Water use, paper production, you name it. So it's really the end of the World War II that sort of changed the trend. This is really a killer when it comes to thinking about the relationship between humans and nature. It's a, a trend of urbanization and the, uh, uh, the proportion of uh, human population estimated to be living in the urbanized areas. Initially, it was very, very low, as you can see, but it began to increase around here, 18th century, and they uh, began to shoot up. And a few years ago, the by estimation, 
more humans are living in the uh, cities than in the rural area um, around the world. That happened only a few years ago. So what that means is that the humans are living in the in the places where the um, there is some kind of a human constructed you know, uh, physical environment around themselves between nature and humans, and the um, the culturally speaking, a kind of parallel trends have been happening as well. And looking at the uh, entries to the uh, Oxford the English Dictionary, uh, the um, entries about the uh, related to nature, and this is about plants. Um, it's an incredibly interesting uh, research about the entries of the uh, LOED. Um, and the, uh, you can see that the entries being fairly stable for, until the, the beginning of the 18th century. And then the, uh, it began to shoot up. Around the time of, of uh, Darwin, actually, it peaked. And then it plummeted. So this could be seen as an indication of humans, or at least the English speakers, interest in nature or newly acquired knowledge about nature. And this is a, a trend of the references to nature related terms in popular culture. And this is about the English fiction and the other sorts of um, movies and so on. The similar trends can be seen. Basically, it was there in the early part of the 20th century, but it began to decrease again around 1950. What's been going on after that? Everybody knows, right? It's climate change. I mean, these are all correlated um, events and be it friends, but everything is pointing towards the same direction. We are being separated from the rest of nature. As we do so, things begin to go a bit wild. Right, so human niche construction seems to be going nowhere, and the perhaps say of tipping the balance between what we can create and do, and um, the rest of nature can somehow handle. And the, um, um, it is this kind of unbalance that's prompting some geologists to say that we should be calling a new epoch um, the Anthropocene. The Anthropos, that is the humans, era. Now, what would be the kind of things that's happening at the moment? And my way of thinking is that it's really about the people's um, the future oriented thinking and how we would like to construct the future. And the inner is an important element that is utopia. What would be a desired way of living? What would be a better way of living than now? And the, um, that, that sort of uh, thinking is pretty abundant everywhere. And there's been a lot of a, a scholarship in the social sciences, as well as the uh, mostly qualitative work and humanities. And the, what we did was to try to kind of gauge people's understanding of these sorts of ideal societies and in four different um, uh, the samples, a, a, uh, Australia and the, uh, the UK, the US, and People's Republic of China. And the, uh, uh, without going into the details, we could identify at least four major uh, profiles, if you like, of utopia. One is a futurist one. The science and technology is going to change everything and we'll be living in the, uh, the world of abundance. And it's the, the science and technology, probably including the AI, would be the savior of the world. And the second one is a kind of modern green or green new deal sort of idea. Science and technology can be used to harness and somehow we can be living in the ever environmentally friendly uh, cities of the future. And the third one is a kind of primitivist, uh, primitivist green Arcadian um, the ideal, or perhaps a Garden of Eden. We can go back to the primitive state and live happily. And the, uh, the fourth one is a non secular version, and some sort of a supernatural beings are going to come and fix everything for us. Um, this is a relative minority, even across those four uh, samples, uh, but it's there. Um, but it's those three um, 
kind of a, a if you like utopian visions that seem to be structuring a lot of the discourse surrounding climate change for instance so this would be a big growth kind of idea and this would be the modern brain kind of idea and the first one is kind of like a business as usual if we keep going we'll be getting there anyway so the political polarization, my view, can be thought of as cultural dynamics involving these sorts of utopian visions uh, for collective futures and people fighting out for the supremacy, how best to construct a better future. Okay, and the, um, I'm going to spend another probably, hopefully, 25 minutes, if that's all right, maybe 30 minutes, um, to talk about the, the ways in which I've been thinking about how this kind of cultural dynamics might work out. So it's really about how might macro level cultural transformations like the you know, this interest in nature might develop over time and how micro level individual processes, psychological processes uh, might be contributing to it and the uh, vice versa. So it's really the micro macro relationship in the social science parlance. But the, uh, um, the the way I've been approaching it is to think of the meso level, that is social network level, as a mediating process that really gives us a clearer idea about how the micro and the macro might be related to each other. So in my view, social networks can be thought of as say, yes, some sort of potentials for social interaction and also cultural transmission. In fact, whenever we interact with each other, we tend to transmit cultural information. They tend to go, go together hand in hand. And the, um, um, so social networks is a kind of construction uh, concepts that help us think about this, what enables and constrain uh, social interaction patterns and cultural transmission within a population. And there's a different ways in which cultural transmission can happen. And the, uh, what's being studied is this kind of transmission, that is transmission across generations. The uh, former generation passing on the information, culturally acquired information to the next generation. The younger generation might imitate and learn, the older generation might instruct and teach, but the uh, humans and also other sorts of animals all do engage in collaborative learning. That is to pass on information between within the same generation, between different peoples, different uh, um, the I guess occupational groups, and the, uh, this hasn't been done studied too much actually. This has been done a lot, and the, it's this that um, I've been very much concerned about, and the kind of research I've been doing. Um, one way of thinking about this and how that sort of a, a collaborative learning happens um, is a, to think of it as a kind of a constant internalization and externalization of cultural information uh, within the uh, social context. So we store cultural information in memory and we produce it, externalize it, and then share that with other people. And, but of course, that is interpreted and, and then stored into memory. So there is this kind of a constant circle going on between two people, many more people. So you can think of it as a kind of like a you know, couple of oscillators or something like that. Um, but the, um, uh, also, what's interesting is this artifact. We produce artifacts that bear some information, cultural information, and puts it out there, and other people can see it and then interpret it and learn it again too. So these, there's these sort of constant internalization and externalization of cultural information. And through that mechanism, we a, a share information and the uh, transmit cultural information. So and then the, how do we kind of go from macro to micro? And the key construct that the, uh, I latched onto is norm. And the, it's a fairly ubiquitous concept. And the, if you talk to any social scientist, they, they are likely to say, well, that's one of the key concepts we have to be thinking about. And the norm is meant to be a kind of describing 
the general tendency of the uh, behavior patterns within the population. And the, um, um, with, that is meant to be influencing a behavior so that you can see the discernible pattern of the behavior in one group or population to another, and they might be different and so on. But the uh, very little has been investigated, as, uh, as far as I know, about how people learn social norms. And the, there have been a lot of research about socialization, and that's all about the cross-generational transmission of cultural information, and that's all good. But we do learn between, within the same generation. Think about the fact that we move across different, uh, uh, to different places. When you moved here, you probably had to learn a new norm about, say, how to behave, how to use a public transport, um, and everything. But how do we learn that? And the, um, the uh, once that's learned, how is it going to be influencing our behavior? Is there any way that social networks might be implicated in? So let's first uh, have a look at the uh, at the acquisition of social norms. Let's say that the, uh, there's that one person over here that's trying to learn the social norm around this new place in Berlin. There are two ways, basically, way of uh, learning these sorts of informal norms. One is that somebody tells you this is how things are done around here. So these old timers will come around and say, I'll tell you, mate, this is how you behave. And another possibility is you, you look around and so you observe how people behave. And then based on that, you make inferences about what's usually the text around here. So uh, in the sort of cognitive psychology powers, the uh, other people telling you what to do, that's conceptual sort of a, a route of learning. And the other one, observing and experiencing how things are done and acquire that norm, that's experiential route. And the, uh, we try to investigate that, which route is more dominant, both of them are possible, are they interacting in some way? And in order to do it, we went to a, a, this rural uh, community in the inland of Australia, I live here, and it's about a few hundred kilometers north uh, in the outback of Bay Australia. Not quite outback, outback, but anyway, it's a, it's a fairly rural area. And the, um, um, because the uh, social network data tends to have a lot of dependencies in it, it's not straightforward to analyze, but the, uh, thankfully there's a statistical modeling technique that's called auto logistic after attribute modeling. Um, we could make use of it after doing this snowball sampling. So managed to estimate the effects of other people's um, BA, uh, behaviors on the person's, the central person's a, um, uh, perception of the social norm. In this case, is a, how engaged a, a community would be in this rural area. So the, uh, the people have to learn how much of a, a social engagement or community engagement do people come around and help each other, or do they have this, uh, you know, a, a, a barbecue every week, or it doesn't happen that that frequently? But do, you, do do people get together and try to make plans for uh, the uh, cities in the future and so on? Uh, these sorts of things, and the, um, we try to investigate, and I'll get back to you in a minute. Um, in the end, the, we didn't find any evidence of this. But it's a, the perception of people's norms were actually coming from their observations of what other people did. Yes, somebody else. Yeah, yeah. And just to ask if you sample the networks again from surveys or from. Yeah, this is a, uh, a, a kind of survey that's a usual sort of social network survey of the uh, name generator. So you ask people to name. Um, a person who is a um, yeah, um, but the uh, this is a snowball sampled. So mm -hmm. we have the uh, I can't remember how many we had probably about 50, 20 or thirty people, um, very diverse people, and then for each person to nominate a few people, yeah. and then from there yeah, I got them to nominate a few people and went on, mm -hmm. and they, I think we went as far as third generation, third wave. And they, uh, we had about 150 or so people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, it, it, it sort of, as you can measure, the modeling of that data is a bit challenging. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's what uh, we did. And as I said, in the end, this wasn't the case. So people actually observed other people's behavior and infer norms. After after thought, it yeah, sort of makes sense. And you, you you might hear other people say, "Well, this is how things are done in this, in this community," um, but you don't sort of jump to that conclusion and say, "This is how I'm going to behave." Probably what you do is to say, "All right, that might be the case." So hypothesis, and you might test it with your against your own experience, and in the end, you might decide how to behave. So it sort of makes sense. Now, cognitively speaking, psychologically speaking, how do we understand this? And, the, and, and there was a simple answer to me. You can see it, it's basically exemplar based, a category, but a community is a social category, right? It's just that the you are included in it. And the, um, the, when you're trying to uh, acquire an norm or learn a norm, you're basically trying to learn the distribution behaviors within that social category. And what is it? It's basically exemplar based social category. Right? And they say a, a decent a model uh, or a model of that kind of learning process. So the, in the end, what I ended up doing was to construct the uh, distributed memory model of these sorts of processes. And the, um, it sort of uh, worked very well. There's a kind of divergent uh, literature on this kind of a, a computational models. And the, um, I was able to use this uh, distributed memory model as an algorithmic level model to integrate those disparate uh, lines of research. And the, in the end, you can just basically think of um, uh, this sort of a uh, norm acquisition and social category learning as a, uh, a, a simple memory updating. So you learn the norm as a, a natural process, if you like, a natural consequence of going about your living. And so you, yeah, so the, you just to learn a more, you, your mind is set up like that. Um, and this is just to say that the, the model seems to fit the experimental data fairly well. Now, what happens when you acquire more and the, uh, the people, of course, begin to talk about it, but there are two different ways of talking about a norm. One is to say explicitly, this is a norm and you should behave like that, right? But uh, yeah, this is an explicit conceptual route to uh, communicating about a norm. But the other way is really to uh, talk about the norm in a very indirect way by gossip. So-and-so did this, and that's bad. Or so-and-so did this, and that's great. And that is gossip, right? But that conveys a norm. And the, either way, the, um, our experiments show that communicating this sort of information one-on-one -on -one within the social network is sufficient to um, remind people of the normative constraints of the behavior and the, um, help them to behave in accordingly to some extent. Um, without going into the details, it was a four-person um, the uh, public goods game, and the, uh, each person was able to send a received message about the, uh, these sorts of norm. We call it norm talk. Um, in four different conditions, the, uh, a, this form a norm talk was happening in different combinations, but in one condition, there was no norm talk. And this gray line indicates what happens when there's no no reminders of these sorts of norms in the form of gossip or in the form of explicit a uh, conceptual transmission of norms to cooperate that is in this case it basically declines over time and this has been replicated so many times it's such a very uh, stable uh, findings you start up a little bit of a cooperation it declines over time and stabilizes eventually but the what's interesting is the norm a normal talk condition. We have we enable people to send and receive message of norms after every five rounds of gameplay. And the, what we found was that after the norm talk, the cooperation level picked up. 
and then it be climbing all the time. And fifth, again, pick up and come down. There's this kind of a zigzag. And the, um, uh, in, in other words, the norm talk enables people to be reminded of the, uh, what should be done. And the, that was enough to pick up the level of cooperation in public goods game, but eventually it came down. So the, um, it, it had to be repeated all the time. And in, in a way, um, this kind of norm talk and norm fest has to be ritualized, probably. And that can, though, however, is sufficient to sustain a level of cooperation over time. Okay. Uh, sorry. Just to improve the sound quality. All right. And the, um, uh, what's interesting, especially in this case, was that the when people just gossiping, that le the uh, level of cooperation was highest for whatever is the reason. Don't know. So were people gossiping about specific other people or in general? Specific other person. Yeah. yeah. And then people had identities. Like uh, not the uh, your real identity, but the uh, this person A or person B. Yeah, so you you could remember who who it was. Yes. Is it, uh, okay. In principle, that is. Yes. Um, was there already like a like a complication at the beginning of the game? Because like this different the building condition seems to have happened already before the first. Uh, this time. No, there's no communication happening. Okay, so that's this just by chance. Just chance. Okay. So this is the uh, kind of. The, uh, the chance level variability to begin with. No, I, I mean up to five, for instance. There, there was no, the, the only, the only competition happened in the, in the round five, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. And the, uh, so it looks like norm can be translated into micro level human behaviors through learning and the reminding um, of the, uh, of the norms. Uh, within the uh, uh, social networks. Now, uh, what about the micro level to micro level? Would that be the, uh, the other way around? Um, any sort of influence happening? In order to look at it, we uh, began to use something called the serial reproduction uh, experimental paradigm, especially in, in order to look at the um, information flow within social networks. So things like that would happen. In other words, so you, when people begin to talk, the, um, the information doesn't stay there within that diet, but it spreads. And the, uh, this sort of diffusion of information is going to be the engine of the um, uh, cultural dynamics, I think. And the, um, um, the method we use is uh, something called the method of zero reduction that was invented by actually uh, as Sir Frederick Bartlett. Um, it said that the, uh, it came from a, um, a conversation with the uh, cybernetics researcher. And the um, um, it later on was used by social psychologists. And the uh, uh, most recently, it was used by people in cognitive uh, areas in the form of iterated learning. It's kind of fortuitous that the, uh, we began to use the same, almost exactly the same external paradigm at about the same time. So without my knowing anything about them, the, um, I began to use it uh, in the uh, towards the end of 1990s and published a paper in 2000. In this case, uh, we constructed a story of a, a Gary the footballer. Um, it's uh, just a, a, a simple story of a, uh, a football player. That's the North Shea rules football. Um, the, uh, probably you don't see this in this country or this part of the world, but it's a very popular, a really macho, fast. Um, the furious kind of game. And the, uh, uh, you can imagine the uh, stereotype that goes with the uh, this sort of uh, football play. Um, it's very macho, beer drinking, and the um, uh, loud mouthing, and the uh, uh, drink driving, and abusing police if you get caught. But that's the sort of stereotype. And the, uh, so we embedded that sort of stereotype in the uh, story. So, of course, stereotype consistent story. Gary, the footballer, and his mates drive beers in the car, Gary abused the police, those sorts of things, but also included the very inconsistent information, like Gary bought flowers for himself, not for his girlfriend, but for himself, 
and Gary listened to classical music, Mozart, when you are drunk. And the, um, uh, this sort of information was distributed in uh, different parts of the story and the uh, uh, five person serial reproduction chain. That is to say, you give that story to a person and that person gives uh, retells the story to the second person. The second person retells the story from memory to a third person and so on. In this case, written communication was used and this is the results. So there are two parts to the story. But the, in the central part of the story where the plot happens, the um, stereotype inconsistent information was initially reproduced and communicated a little bit more than consistent, but over time, the, um, it got reversed. And so in the end, consistent information tends to stay on, and the, um, in the other parts of the story, that was true throughout. So basically, the, um, any sort of information that's passed on tends to become more conventionalized, as the uh, about it called it, and the, uh, it tends to therefore maintain a cultural uh, existing, pre-existing culture. And the uh, um, an interesting question is why? And actually, here we find the play the importance of the norm again, especially the perception of the norm. But let me go back. Um, one step and tell you a little bit more. The, um, whenever you're trying to uh, communicate some information to a person, another person, the, in fact, you're faced with the uh, kind of dilemma. One dilemma, the one side of the dilemma is that you want to be informative, right? You want to inform the other person. This is a new piece of information you might want to know. And, but the other, on the other side, you want to maintain the right sort of social relationship with the person. So the, um, you want to connect to the person and also you want to be informative to the other person. How do you, how do you strike the balance between the two is an interesting question because being informative usually means that you're challenging the um, status quo and what everybody thinks is happening. And that means the, it could disturb or disrupt the social relationship. So by sticking a neck out and say, this is something you might not know about, but this is a strange thing that happened and I'm telling you, that could challenge or that could disturb a social relationship. So you don't want to risk that under some circumstances, but you might have to under some others. So there's that kind of trade-off between social connectivity and being informative. And the, um, um, in the typical social serial reproduction experiments, what we found was that the stereotypicality of information tends to be positively related to social connectivity. That is, stereotypical information tends to be socially connected. That is to say, you think the, um, uh, by saying something stereotypical, you know, this guy, uh, you know, a footballer, um, he's, he abused the police at, you know, they, those, those guys tend to do that, right? And by speaking like that, you're sort of communicating that we're in it together. You and I share the same sort of backgrounds. We know some, the same things. Let's say yeah, we belong in the same group, right? We might even go far to say that they, we are living in the same sort of world. And the, so in that sense, social connect, social connected, but not necessarily informative. But collective information tends to be seen to be communicable. It's easier to talk to, talk about with other people. And that tends to actually predict the diffusion of that information in serial reproduction. So the more communicable information is seen to be, that tends to travel farther into this uh, serial reproduction. But the, um, what's modifying this is the um, endorsement of the stereotype. Stereotypical information is seen to be connected because it is seen to be endorsed by the community of the people that you're talking to. If that is disturbed, that is likely to disturb this link and the rest of it might go. And that's in fact what happened. We manipulated the perception of the stereotype endorsement within the community and the so that's the low perceived endorsement condition. In this case, the difference between the transmittability of stereotypical information 
this one, and countless three typical information disappear. But when the stereotype is seen to be widespread within the community, that uh, different stereotype consistency bias emerged again. So it's really that kind of perception of the norm, what people think that the community thinks is seems to be driving this kind of a tendency to maintain culture. Now, there's another piece of evidence that seems to suggest the same kind of uh, idea. That is that the, um, um, it's a bit more complicated story, but the, uh, the, the upshot of the idea is that people are likely to speak stereotypically when they think they are talking to their in-group member about the out-group member. Well, these guys are different and we know they are different and they, we are friends, they are kind of different. By othering others, you can share. The last interesting piece of information I was going to tell you is that the um, cultural transmission of this sort tends to be a, or emotion tends to be very robust through this kind of cultural transmission. The content might change and details might change, but emotional um, tone tends to remain. And also the emotive information tends to tends to be transmitted more. So the, um, I, in many ways, emotion and cultural information transmission tend to go together, I think. And the, um, under the societal threats, like the current one, um, the emotions run high, and those emotive information stories are likely to be transmitted, and it's the emotion that tends to be transmitted rather than the details of the story. That's the kind of a generalization that one could make of it. Okay, so that's a sort of a, a normal situation where things are information is spreading within the within the population. What if there is a conflict between those two people, and the, they might be segregating into two different sort of camps? How does that happen? And as the information spreads. Do they change the form? And you can probably guess, right? Even if it's a story about the same conflict between these two people, when it spreads this way, it becomes in group favoring this way, but it spreads that way, it becomes in group favoring that way. The end result is a very different story about the same event. And in fact, that seems to happen. Um, and the, uh, uh, without going into the details, again, we use the serial reproduction paradigm and the uh, gay people the same story and they uh, got them to transmit it. But the, in one condition, they told them that they, you are friends of this group who is having a fight. And in the other condition, um, you're a third party um, neutral observer. And basically, when you, people are told that the, yeah, just transmit the information as a neutral observer, uh, no bias emerges. The green line is what it is in terms of positive and negative um, sort of impression producing information. But the, um, when the uh, uh, people are, take, are asked to uh, take the partisan role, that tends to produce a very strong in group favoring and out group rejecting sort of content in the story. So, polarization and fragmentation, we can return finally. And the, what I began to wonder is say, what sort of role would cognition this level would play in conjunction with the meso-level processes? I think both of them in combination can play cover. And the, a lot of people have been thinking very much about this one. And the echo chamber formation and so on has been a major a kind of theorizing and research. And that it indeed seems to be happening, but not as much as the, um, uh, the uh, was feared. Um, certainly that is uh, happening in the United States. 
but the, in other parts of the world, it's not as bad. Um, we've done some a, a literature review um, in cross-cultural areas and the post-national differences, and the, the US seems to be one of the worst. But anyway, the, um, what I'm going to tell you now is a, a, just the beginning of a, a research about the, how cognition and social network dynamics might uh, interact to produce these sorts of polarization phenomena um, through simulation work. We basically use the same kind of a, a distributed memory model that I was telling you about, and sort of dress them out from the uh, history and the uh, still usable, uh, and they uh, produce the uh, a new kind uh, of uh, structure. And they try to model two different kinds of biases that seem to be discernible in the literature. One is highly cognitive, the other is more motivational, but uh, we can interpret them in terms of interpretive bias and memory bias. Anyway, again, details I'm going to skip. But the, um, um, in the end, depending on how they're combined, we can produce four different types of cognitive agents. And the, uh, what's interesting is that the, uh, depending on the combination, actually, you can produce an agent that doesn't have any bias whatsoever. And the, uh, this kind of agent is a changing their opinions depending on what sort of input they get. Um, this kind of agent is cognitively just determined and the ideologically biased through and through. They never change their opinions. Interesting one is this. These guys bifurcate depending on what sort of inputs they get. And the, uh, some of them become staunchly ideological and others become the nemesis of the ideologically oriented person. It's a sort of, it produces the oppositions as a natural consequence of these sorts of cognitive biases. The third one is the um, a more sort of motivated um, a defender of an ideology. The, it sort of grabs its feet and they try not to change the, uh, their ideology by defending that, but eventually if there's mounting evidence, they can change in opinions as well. So these are the sorts of reasonable people, if you like. And the, uh, these guys are kind of like a, um, a ideological, uh, I don't know, whatever, the completely close-minded people. And the, um, um, but these people can change their behaviors, ideological behaviors, depending on how social network dynamics play out. So, um, what we tried to do was to model the social influence processes by using freaking, say, fairly uh, classic work on social network and based network influence models. And the, he developed more recently the uh, multi dimensional version of it. And the, um, um, I uh, put that into a, another social network dynamics um, the element. And the, that is to say, uh, when uh, people have uh, different opinions or kind of pattern of opinions, and then the, uh, they are several ties. So in social network parlance, you might call it the um, heterophobia. Uh, so heterophobic tendencies are built into this partner selection processes. When that happens, the, um, uh, these sorts of a, a somewhat a, an ideologically biased, but nonetheless, reasonable people become like that. They're basically caught in the, um, um, the echo chamber and the, uh, they'll just basically stick to their ideology. What about these sorts of people? Well, under normal circumstances, actually they form a consensus. They, or they converge into the average, really. And they, it's been shown that that's the case under most circumstances. But when you include the social network dynamics, that is the um, uh, heterophobic tendencies or the um, homophilic tendencies, strong ones, and then under some circumstances, this happens. And that is to say, they form into different um, as separated social network structures. And within the social network structure, they begin to form 
that echo chamber and the that drives them into a, a very kind of peculiar set of ideas and the they just run parallel and and the and in this particular simulation there are I think 100 agents only 100 if you can increase more um the uh, we found up to three or four opinion clusters so the it, it's really that kind of a sort of network dynamics combined with cognitive biases that seem to be able to produce these sorts of things and the um, uh, we'd like to be investigating the actual uh, sort of products of these things um, in, in in research empirical research anyway so this is pretty much the conclusion and uh, they uh, like to think of this sort of a um, cultural dynamics in these sorts of uh, more processual ways and the uh, thinking about the uh, different profile of utopias as people's ways of engaging with this uh, future constructions and the uh, how that conversation might be playing out over time and how that might shape a future so that's my research question thank you